afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from the uh, Royal York Hotel in downtown Toronto. Welcome to the continuation of the 112th season of the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you who are just joining us either through our webcast, our podcast, or on Rogers Television, welcome to our meeting today. Before our distinguished speaker is introduced, or speakers rather, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our head table. And I'd ask that each guest at the table rise for a brief moment and then be seated as your name is called. And I'd ask please that the audience refrain from applause until all head table guests have been introduced. So starting with our moderator today, Ms. Pia Chattopadhyay, host, CBC Radio and TVO Television. Dr. James Downer, critical and palliative care physician, University Health Network and program director for the conjoint program in palliative care medicine at the University of Toronto. Ms. Shanaz Gokul, the CEO, Dying with Dignity. Mr. Gareth Seltzer, the co-founder of Riot News, film producer and explorist, and a past president of the Empire Club of Canada. Dr. Philippe Hébert, Professor Emeritus, Family Medicine, University of Toronto. Dr. Daniel L. Bain, the Chief Investment Officer and CEO, Thornmark Asset Management, Inc. Professor Jennifer Gibson, Sun Life Financial Chair in Bioethics and Director, Joint Center for Bioethics, and Associate Professor, Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation, Dalai Lama School of Public Health, University of Toronto. Mr. Wayne Sumner, University Professor Emeritus, Department of Philosophy, University of Toronto. Ms. Maureen Taylor, Physician Assistant in Infectious Diseases at Toronto East General Hospital and Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. My name is Gordon McIver. I'm the Executive Director of the National Executive Forum on Public Property and the President of the Empire Club of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table. We also are very pleased to welcome today a group of students who are joining us both from the nursing and the MBA programs at Ryerson University. Students, would you please rise and be recognized? Welcome. The last two weeks has been a strange time in Canada as the unpleasant question of suicide was on most people's minds. First, there was the horrible news out of a remote Aboriginal community that their young people were attempting to take their own lives in staggering numbers, leading many of our citizens to wonder just how awful living conditions have to be before you actually don't see any way out and want to end your own life. Furthermore, it was apparent from the international media that the whole world was following this story, which, surprise, not surprisingly, makes many Canadians feel somewhat ashamed. Secondly, the federal government introduced legislation two weeks ago to legalize physician-assisted suicide for Canadians with serious medical conditions, a bill that's likely to pass given the Liberal majority in the House. If it does indeed pass, Canada will join Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany as a country where it is henceforth viewed as uh, unconstitutional to deny the option of assisted death to consenting adults who are suffering and have an irremediable medical condition. Like abortion, the legislation of marijuana and same-sex marriage, assisted suicide is a hard, highly charged issue that no government in the world would ever get total consensus on. Furthermore, it's a highly personal issue, one that has no right and wrong answer, but rather widely divergent opinions based on personal belief systems, socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds, and of course, religious convictions. While some attempt to give it a political color, it is in reality, reality significantly more complex and is colored by many life and personal experiences. Our own Prime Minister began to think a lot about this issue as his father, who, his father who was arguably the most famous leader this country has ever produced, lay dying in a state of misery as he endured endless aggressive treatments for prostate cancer and Parkinson's disease. My own mother, who passed away last year after a dynamic and very full life, wanted desperately to travel to Switzerland and end her own life with dignity, surrounded by family, after a terminal cancer diagnosis she strongly believed would lead to suffering and despair. While the plane ticket to Switzerland was reserved and all the paperwork completed, she died quickly and mercifully without a long period of suffering. But, like so many Canadians before me, it made me do a lot of soul-searching on how I felt about the question 
as I'd always believed deeply that suicide was a human attempt at playing God. I don't believe that anymore, <clears throat> at all, but certainly understand and respect those that do. In short, it's a deeply personal and a very complicated question. The issue was discussed at the Empire Club for the first time by a former Justice Minister, Alan Rock, who addressed the club under then Empire Club President John Campion on March 24, 1995, more than 21 years ago. Although the Supreme Court of Canada had upheld the ban on assisted suicide just two years earlier, in 1993, this was clearly an issue that would not go away, in part due to some highly mediatized cases where individuals who were suffering terribly were begging the courts to give them the right to take their own lives, and seeing this refused time and time again became increasingly difficult to handle. Here's a quote from Minister Rock's 1995 speech. As Minister of Justice, I'm the Cabinet Minister responsible for the framing of policy relating to the justice system and the developing new legislation in relation to the system. On the justice side of the agenda, the issues which have involved me in policy discussions range all the way from child support to gun control, the use of DNA evidence in the courtroom to amendments to the Young Offenders Act, sentencing reform to changes in the Human Rights Act, euthanasia and assisted suicide to criminal code amendments dealing with prostitution. Things have changed. Fast forward to the announcement two weeks ago by the incumbent Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould. And while we are clearly moving at last to legalize this matter, <clears throat> there is still a clear recognition, as the Minister has stated on several occasions already, that this whole dialogue and process will be, quote, troubling. Some see it as barbaric and future evidence of moral decay, while others are equally convinced that it's a hallmark of a compassionate, caring, and highly evolved society. Needless to say, reconciling these two camps will be an extremely difficult process in our country, which is why we wanted at the Empire Club to run this panel discussion today with Dr. James Downer at the University Health Network, Shanaz Gokul, the CEO of Dying with Dignity Canada, and well-known journalist Pia Chattopadhyay. And Pia will be introducing our panelists in more detail, so let me get things rolling right now by introducing her as our panelists take their seats on the stage. Peter Chattopadai has been described as a Swiss army knife for her versatility in hosting a number of flagship shows such as The Current, The World at Six, Metro Morning, The Agenda with Steve Pakin, and many more. She spent more than a decade in the field as a reporter here in Canada and has also reported from around the world. Next month will be a big one in her career as she will become the full-time host of a weekly show for CBC Radio and judging from her past performance, it will be intellectually stimulating and highly entertaining. So, ladies and gentlemen, here to moderate our panel today and to introduce our panelists, please join me in welcoming journalist Pia Chattopadhyay to the podium of the Empire Club of Canada. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. Um, just by way of an agenda, I'm going to talk with these two till about 1.15 or so, and then uh, we're going to have about five or ten minutes for questions, so just so everyone knows that, I think this is an issue that many people have questions on, so we'll go there. Let me just further introduce our two guests today. James Downer is a critical care and palliative care doctor at uh, the University Health Network and Sinai Health Systems. I think that generally means he works at a lot of hospitals. I think that's true. Um, he's also a teacher and assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at U of T. James is a graduate of McGill. He has a master's in bioethics from U of T, and he has been on the Advisory Council of Physicians for Dying with Dignity. Please help me welcome James Downer. And Shanaz Gokul is the CEO of Dying with Dignity Canada. Shanaz is a lifelong human rights activist. She began her um, activism, her campaigning career in the, in the 1980s in Nova Scotia, working on promoting racial e equality and inclusion there. She's also worked for Amnesty International and for the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. Welcome to Shanaz, go cool. Okay, so here we are, Gordon sort of set the stage. Um, a couple weeks ago, the government has introduced proposed legislation. The federal liberals have said that this will not be a whipped vote. We will see what comes to pass when that happens. But let me just begin with this broad question for both of you. Just generally, do you support this legislation, this assisted dying legislation? Okay, I'll, I'll start if that's okay. Uh, so I think we should all remember <laughs> that um, 
you know, this is a historic moment for our country. And our organization, Dying with Dignity Canada, we've had the assisted uh, dying file for over 30 years. So if anyone knows that it's a historic moment, our organization certainly does. And I know there's many supporters in the room who've been with us for a number of years, and I thank you. Uh, however, if not for the Supreme Court of Canada decision, we would not see federal legislation. There has been no political will. It doesn't really matter which uh, party has been uh, in power. Uh, and so, thankfully, there have been some heroic Canadians who've come forward and braved the courts in order for us to have uh, the Supreme Court of Canada's Carter decision. But I will say that Bill C-14 that's been presented to us is problematic at best. It doesn't meet the minimum standards of the Carter decision. Uh, for those of you that have been following this, in February, the federal government struck their own special joint parliamentary committee with senators and MPs to study this. And there was a lot of talk during those hearings that you know, referred to the Carter decision as the floor. Well, what we have now is something that's in the sub-basement. We're not at the floor of Carter. If Kay Carter herself, the appellant in the case uh, for which the decision is named after, would not qualify for an assisted death, I think the legislation as it is, uh, we feel quite strongly it's unacceptable. It needs to be amended moving forward. Uh, and what this government should know is that they have the support of 85% of Canadians who support the Carter decision. Uh, but as I've mentioned, there's always been this disconnect between political leadership and everyone else. Uh, so for all of you, I hope, that are, who are here today and those who may have some discomfort on certain elements that we'll discuss further, we know this is happening, it's coming, but the bill needs to be amended. Okay, just by way of explanation, Kay Carter was a Supreme Court decision. She was a woman who had spinal stenosis, right. um, who died last year, right, um, in, in BC. Many, many, many years, years yeah, ago. A few years the, ago. Sorry, the case was ruled on last year. Uh, and we'll talk more about um, Kay Absolutely. Carter's children because they have views on this legislation as well. Uh, James, but just first of all, as this stands, the proposed law is out there for a couple of weeks. Are you in support of it? I, I think, I just want to echo some of Shanaz's concerns. Um, I, obviously, there's a lot of political rocks and shoals to navigate with this and, and trying to build a consensus that will vote for it. The problem is that when you try to do that, sometimes you will introduce language that will have implications. And the language for any law has to be very precise. Uh, I'm going to focus on, on sort of two specific problems that I have with this legislation. One of them is that the definition of grievous and irremediable illness includes what one would call a reasonably foreseeable death. Um, I think that's gotten a lot of attention in the media, and, and appropriately so, because as a physician, I can tell you that it's actually very hard to decide what that actually means at the bedside. Um, I think anybody alive, on you know, depending on how you look at it, anybody alive has a reasonably foreseeable death. In fact, <laughs> I don't know how you could reasonably foresee anything other than that, frankly. Um, so, you know, if you if you interpret it literally, it's it's potentially meaningless, but certainly open to misinterpretation. And on the flip side, if it's uh, interpreted more narrowly to mean more restricting things to people who are getting close to the end of their life, then that actually is a frank uh, contradiction that's not uh, consistent with the Carter decision, which means that this, uh, this legislation would be a dead letter. Um, and the last thing we want is to have to go right back through all of this, uh, you know, go through a period with no laws and, and have the courts having to decide our laws. It's, it's really time, I think, for, for Parliament to, to grab on to something legislative, write it down, make a set of rules that we can all work mm -hmm. with uh, that aren't going to expose us to vagueness or, or, or potentially misinterpretation. We'll get into the details. <clears throat> As uh, told me the other day, you know, like all legislation, the devil's in the details. And, and we'll talk about some things that, that you just raised there, James, in just a moment. But let me go back to something that Gordon said. This is a divisive issue. We know through polling, I think the majority of Canadians are on side with some sort of assisted death legislation. What that looks like is very different for different people. But I want to go back to that there still is people in this country, there still are people in this country who do not support any kind of legislation. Some of them are just scared, and some of them say, or, or they have other convictions, religious or otherwise. Some people say, you know what, let's put more of an effort into providing better home care and palliative care so we can help with people who are suffering and dying. Um, and other people are, say, you know, this is really pitting individual rights against communal rights. And I just briefly want to get from both of you, um, what do you say to that? Like, what's your, what's your argument to people who said, yep, 
you know what, I don't think we should go this way. Where, how, how do you frame that, James? Well, uh, the, the first answer is simple. that The court has actually taken that policy decision off the table. We're no longer asking whether we should or should not legalize assisted dying. The question is should we or should we not have a law. I, I hope that regardless of your position on assisted dying, it's probably better to have a clear law than to have no law at all and have people essentially trying to interpret a court decision at the bedside you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I, the answer to your second question about whether we should be putting more effort into palliative care, home care, better care, for, yes, 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 and yes. But it's not an either or question. Um, the, the question about access to assisted dying is a question of human rights. It's not a question of care. Even in countries where this is done more commonly and well accepted, it, it accounts for maybe 2 to 3 percent of all deaths. In Oregon, it accounts for 0.3 percent of all deaths. This is never going to be a public health problem or solution. Uh, to our end-of-life issues. We still need the care that's going to be provided to the 97 to 99.9 percent of the population that are not going to go with assisted dying. But there's no evidence to suggest that we have to choose between one or the other. You can have rights, and then you can also adequately fund your end-of-life care system, too. And the studies from other jurisdictions have shown that that's easily, easily doable. And in fact, when you legalize assisted dying, Support for palliative care, support for home care, all of this skyrockets to a greater degree than it does in other countries. So again, a false choice. Shanaz. I agree with that, and especially when you look at the case of Oregon. Of the small percentage of people that actually ask for an assisted death, over 90% of them are already in palliative care. So they're already accessing the best quality palliative care. And we shouldn't be putting people um, in a position, and, and I'll bring this up now because I know it's going to come up a little bit later, uh, where you know they may have to choose between uh, a faith-based institution, many of whom offer some of the best palliative care in this country, or the possibility of maybe two weeks in, I might want an assisted death. So I don't think we want to frame the discussion in an either or that absolutely, I think everyone who supports assisted dying would support better access for palliative care, for home care. Um, but we also believe that Canadians should be able, um, as a human right, to die in the facilities and the locations of their choosing. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about um, Kay Carter. Uh, because last week, well, the federal government says Kay Carter, had she been living today, she, she suffered from spinal uh, stenosis, she suffered insufferably, really. Federal government, the Justice Minister says she would quali have qualified under this proposed legislation. Her family last week, her kids said, you know what? That's not true, that my mother, our mother, would have never qualified for assisted, assisted death under this proposed legislation. What do you think of their concerns? Who's right on this? Is the government right as you read this proposed legislation, or is this family right? So I, th I think we should listen to the family. I think we should listen to the lawyers that took the case to the Supreme Court. Certainly, Joe Arve has come out and, and is questioning where the government's getting their legal advice. But there's another additional problem with the legislation in the definition of grievous and irremediable. In the court's decision, they qualify what irremediable means. It means incurable, for which there is no treatment acceptable to the person. In the federal legislation, they say incurable, but they don't qualify it. And then, of course, we have the whole issue of reasonably foreseeable, which either is nonsensical, because we're all going to die at some point, or it's just a, a de facto way of saying terminal. Her condition, her family has identified, was not terminal. I think James can speak as a, as a, as a medical doctor uh, to that. And so what this means is that if Kay Carter herself wouldn't qualify for an assisted death, think of all the people who have severe chronic illnesses, MS. Um, you could have a severe uh, neurological degenerative condition such as Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's. A lot of people looked to this decision as, uh, you know, not as a, as a way of saying, oh yeah, there's going to be millions of people lining up for an assisted death, but it was supposed to provide millions of people with comfort that if they should have a chronic condition that causes them enduring and intolerable suffering, if it gets so bad, there's comfort in knowing I'm going to have another option. What this legislation as it is, is it shuts so many people out. They will not have an option and they will not be able to access an assisted death. So I think the government should have listened to Lee and Price Carter last week in their press conference and taken their words to heart because they know the suffering their mother would endure, uh, would continue to endure if she was alive today and not able to access an assisted death. James, take us to the front lines as a palliative care doctor. Um, you know, as the arbiter of, of trying to decipher this language, how hard, I, how hard is that when you hear the language that's in the, the legislation, which, as you say, is open to a lot of interpretation? Well, and this is the problem, is that it's open to interpretation. I mean, I can tell you what my opinion is about Kay Carter's case or anybody else's um, uh, case. The question is not what I think, <clears throat> but whether what I think is exactly the same as what everybody else would think. It's about consistency, not about 
uh, it's, it's about the, the lack of clarity leading to an inconsistency. And if you have inconsistent access and inconsistent provision, that's a problem. <clears throat> and in this situation, the fact is that some people will say, well, no, it's clear, and she would have qualified, and other people would say, well, no, she clearly wouldn't have qualified. Just that information alone tells you that this provision is, is not appropriate in that law. It really should be, it should be changed. Is there any way, though, to get the language, quote unquote, right, to be so specific and yet at the same time broad legislation? There is a way. Just use the court's language. I think the court's language is pretty clear. Somebody with a grievous and irremediable medical condition for whom no treatment is acceptable where they're facing enduring and intolerable suffering. I think if the federal government just uses that language, because one of the things that we also know is when the federal government went back to the Supreme Court to ask for an extension, uh, the Supreme Court granted an extraordinary provision that Canadians who were waiting for what was supposed to be February 6th will have now to wait until June the 6th and to mitigate any harm for somebody who was looking forward to that date in order to be able to access an assisted death, they could go to courts in their jurisdiction to apply for a judicial authorized death. The courts have been interpreting, um, there have been a number of cases that have come forward that would not qualify under the federal legislation, but have been qualifying uh, through the court process in the last few months. And I think we have to ask ourselves, who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust a federal government that doesn't seem to want to meet the minimum standard of Carter? Or are we going to trust some of the courts that have already been interpreting Carter to ensure that people who have chronic conditions can still qualify for an assisted death? Okay, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, and I, I want to get to some of the specifics of this proposed legislation. So I want to talk about advanced consent, because that is that's, that's some of the language in this legislation. James, talk to me, again, as a frontline doctor, what that means, advanced consent. <clears throat> well, so this was something that was recommended uh, in the uh, select committee um, as, as an option that would be available and, and in the provincial territorial committee as some, an option that would be available for people. Uh, so this would be a situation where you wouldn't necessarily be at the end stage of your illness, but you anticipate that as a result of your illness, you would not be able at some point in the future to, uh, at that time, give your consent to receive an so assistant. So something like death. dementia. Dementia is the classic example that people bring up. And dementia is a powerful example because many of us have had relatives uh, with advanced dementia and we've seen what that's like. And that often leaves people with a very powerful image of what uh, you know, an advanced illness can look like. And, and many of us have very strong feelings about whether that is a quality of life that we would want or not. So that's a situation that comes up in a lot of people's minds. The issue, of course, is that um, from the classic situations, the cases of uh, assisted dying where people come forward, 80% of the time it's advanced cancer. About 15% of the time it's going to be a neurodegenerative disorder like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, or, or some such. And then uh, an assortment of other diseases make up a very, very small proportion. And it's, it's this situation, unfortunately, that drives a lot of the discussion is how we handle the very tiny minority of other cases um, and, and how you come up with language that will capture what you think you should allow but not what you don't think you should allow. <clears throat> In the case of dementia, the, the issue is that um, when somebody is in front of me with advanced cancer and suffering contemporaneously tells me, you know, I am suffering so much and this is not what I would want to tolerate and I'm willing to forego the rest of my life in the interest of comfort, I can be relatively certain that this is what this person wants, that this person, I can assess whether this person understands what they're asking for and if they understand the consequences and the alternatives. And so I feel more comfortable that this is what we would say meets the standards of informed consent. Whenever somebody is making a decision about the future, then there, there begins to be questions about whether or not um, they can properly anticipate what their quality of life would be like in a given situation. Now, that's not to say that it's not a valid concern, and I'm not making any judgments about what the quality of life might be like when someone has advanced dementia. It just introduces that one element of uncertainty, and some people feel that they're willing to tolerate that level of uncertainty, and others are not. So in the legislation, because it, it says with the proposed legislation, there can't be advanced no. consent. Is that the right move, in your opinion? I, I, uh, to be honest with you, my, my best answer I can give you is I don't think it should be up to me. Um, I, this is a, a social question. This is not a medical question. I can tell you that there are a number of limitations in using advanced consent for any decision. What I can tell you is that we do use advanced directives all the time for making end-of-life decisions. So about a third of the population before we die 
we will have a life and death decision made for us on our behalf by a loved one or a substitute decision maker, and they're trying to imagine what we would want in that given situation. So whether that's to stop a certain therapy, to withdraw life-sustaining measures, some such decision <clears throat> made on our behalf. So we're already making life and death decisions for other people. And the question, obviously, that there's going to be some uncertainty involved in that. And the question is, are we, is that a level of uncertainty that we're willing to tolerate for this situation as well? That is not a medical question. Hmm. Let me ask you, Shanaz, what, what do you think about leaving out advanced consent in this legislation? Yeah, I think we really want to look at the legislation and understand what it means to be able to have capacity at end of life. So before I get into advanced consent for people with a diagnosis like dementia, let's just look at it from where it is. So let's just say John. John has, um, uh, you know, he has a, a, a terminal cancer and uh, he would like to make a request for an assisted death. So he does that. He meets with his doctors, he follows all this, the procedural safeguards, he's got his witnesses, it's all in writing, and then he has an uh, appointment on Wednesday for an assisted death. Doctor's gonna come to his house, his family's gonna be there, uh, and he's gonna die peacefully. Monday evening, John uh, has a stroke and slips into a coma. He can't give consent at the time of death. According to this legislation, John may, may, may have to ling, uh, linger on um, uh, without ever being able to access an assisted death. The legislation also calls for a 15-day waiting period. So once again, you have someone who uh, somewhere in there <laughs> may, you know, may lose capacity and not be able uh, to provide consent. So they may also have to languish on um, and, and suffer uh, intolerably because they're not going to be able to give consent. As we think about advanced consent for people with dementia, what we know is that this is an issue that Canadians strongly support. We've polled on it 80%. The federal external panel from the last government polled on it 63%. Angus Reid polled on it and didn't release those uh, findings in their media highlights just a few weeks ago. 66% of Canadians support advanced consent for dementia, uh, for people with dementia. And what I would say is that what we would prefer to see in this legislation, which completely excludes people, so you're quite arbitrarily, if you happen to you know, have this medical condition, you can't control it, you're off the table. You won't be able to ask for one um, when you've lost capacity, um, and you won't be able to ask for one while you still have capacity. So you've got a cruel choice ahead. Will I take my own life now while I still can, or will I wait and will I have to die in a horrible manner, in what I would define as a horrible manner? So what this government has is they have a choice to make. And instead of saying that you know, we invite a charter challenge of some poor person with such a diagnosis to have to show the courage that they're not willing at this point to show, they have a moment here to show courage and to act uh, responsibly. They can uh, commission a study and phase in uh, legislation in three years. So take that time to understand how, what are the processes and protocols that need to be in place, rather than just saying, you're off the table. Let me ask you about another issue that um, a lot of people have been debating in the last week in this proposed le legislation. That's issues regarding mental health. So this legislation, as proposed, does not apply to certain people who have mental health issues or challenges. Is that the right move, James? <clears throat> we need to recognize that mental suffering, uh, mental anguish, and, and psychological, psychiatric distress is as valid as, as any other sort of physical pain or other causes of distress. And very often, people who are requesting assisted death are not necessarily doing so because of, of refractory physical symptoms, but because of those psychological and psychiatric symptoms. It's also important not to stigmatize and treat this differently um, as we are coming to understand and accept that mental illness is real. It's an illness like anything else. It's not just uh, somebody feeling down or having a bad attitude. And so I think part of the way that we treat mental illness, and this actually does stem from the old you know, stigmatism that we attach to mental illness as being, you know, it's not a real illness, so it shouldn't really be a real indication for this. That said, it is one of those conditions where um, there are new treatments coming out all the time. My own brother is a, is a psychiatrist who treats uh, some of these very difficult cases. And uh, you know, from talking to him and his colleagues, you can tell that it is not always easy to, to, to know when somebody truly is beyond the point where they can, they, you can offer them something that will help them. And there are a lot of therapies that people don't receive. Um, at the same time, if it's a younger person, we know this is a big issue for younger people, um, you're potentially, if they, if they do receive an assisted death, sacrificing a lot of years of life, um, as opposed to somebody who has a terminal illness and is going to die in a very short amount of time, we as a society look at those two situations very differently. But I, I don't think that there's any legal, ethical, or moral reason to 
fundamentally a priori treat mental illness differently than you would for any other type of illness in this situation. I think it is reasonable to think about different safeguards mm. uh, and perhaps a different uh, standard for deciding when somebody is meeting eligibility criteria when they have a primary mental illness. But I want to emphasize also from the other jurisdictions, like uh, in Europe, where it is legal, and this is one of the indications, it is very, very rare. Um, I, I think uh, it's important not to let uh, this issue dramatically change uh, the way that we craft a law that actually works well for a large majority of people when it doesn't apply. And just to be clear, in case anyone uh, doesn't know this yet, uh, the, the, the proposed legislation excludes minors. and You have to be 18 uh, if this legislation should pass. Shanaz, we've got a couple minutes left, but where are you on this issue of mental health and, and the government saying, yep, that's not going to qualify? So I would echo a lot of uh, Dr. Downer's comments. Uh, we don't want to further stigmatize people. We don't want to arbitrarily discriminate against a classification of people uh, because they happen to have a certain uh, condition. And I think, once again, the onus is upon the government not to invite costly uh, charter challenges uh, for people who are very, very ill. That the way to, you know, and, and I'll sort of backtrack a little. I think what came out of the Special Joint Parliamentary Committee report back in February for a number of people was a little bit of sticker shock. Right? Oh, it's, it's chronic illness, and oh, it's mental illness, and it's mature minors, and it's advanced consent. What we know is we know the Canadians are having a discussion about advanced consent and their concerns around dementia. There's a lot of support for it. Even within our own organization, uh, the issue of mature minors and mental illness is a fairly new component to the discussion around assisted dying. So I think it's fair to say that rather than just, you know, once again, exclude a whole group of people uh, in perpetuity, invite some 16-year-old who has terminal cancer to go to court to access what will be their charter right and they'll probably be dead by the time it gets to court. Rather than going that route, the government has the option of saying, you know what, these are difficult areas. These are, we don't know all the details. We need to understand the processes and the protocols. Let's study it for three years and we're gonna phase it in. The sticker shock will be over because right now what they're saying is we're gonna review it in five years. I'll tell you what's happening in five years, a federal election. No one's going to want to touch it then. They have the opportunity now to show political leadership. Do you ever think that the government may want the courts to decide this? Just get out of, hey, it might be the best way. Let's put it in the court's hands. Absolutely. I think that's exactly the strategy that many, uh, I think, would want to take in this situation uh, because, you know, they're... they're their idea really is that rather than take on the difficult questions and run the risk of alienating uh, a certain segment of the electorate, uh, they'll say whatever they think they need to say and then throw them, understanding that the courts are going to strike it down anyway. I, I really hope that isn't the attitude that, that ends up being taken because I think that's an abrogation of our responsibility. People decry the sort of legislating from the bench and the courts doing the job of parliament. Well, if the courts are doing the job of parliament, that's because parliament's not doing its job. Mm. And the job of an elected representative, frankly, is to either lead or represent the population and, and not simply to pass the buck on to somebody else and pretend like they didn't really have a say in the matter. It's, it's a mark of a responsible democracy that we take ownership of this and do our jobs. Shanaz, just before we wrap up and open it up to questions, uh, June 6th is this deadline, whether or not that stays the deadline uh, for the government to, to be seen. Again, at this point, they're saying it won't be a whipped vote. But if this proposed legislation goes, you know, it doesn't change. Will Dying with Dignity Canada support this? Uh, what I will say is that all Canadians need to be reminded that this federal government came into power with the promise to both uphold uh, the Carter decision and to respect and not bring any legislation to the House that wasn't charter compliant, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So I think it would be very difficult if there are no substantive changes to ensure that the legislation meets the minimum standards of Carter and includes other provisions so that other groups of people won't be just arbitrarily excluded for our organization. But I would also say to all of you, I think it would be very difficult uh, for Canadians to accept that they've put forward legislation that doesn't meet Carter and it doesn't meet the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Thank you to you both. Clearly, this is a difficult issue, still difficult moving forward, and we'll see where it all goes with legislation. Thank you. <laughs> so, Taylor, thank you. My friend Taylor back there, I believe, has a microphone, or someone has a microphone. So, if you'd put up your hand, and we'll send people on their way. Someone has a question about this, it's a provocative issue. No one has questions? Really? This gentleman has a question. 
I was interested that the President referred to this as assisted suicide. Could we please drop that phrase? This is not assisted suicide. This assisted or aided dying, and I would appreciate it if the panel might comment. That's a really good point. <laughs> I think um, in the last in the last year, certainly since the uh, the Supreme Court's decision, we've actually seen a massive cultural shift in attitudes around death and dying. Uh, and for our organization, and for some people who've worked in our organization for years, trying to shift the language over to reflect what we're really talking about, uh, helping suffering uh, people to die, has been a monumental struggle. But we've seen it, and we've seen it in the media, and language matters. So that when we're discussing this issue, I, I appreciate and take the reference to Attawapiskat, but that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about people who are suffering intolerably uh, and who need aid in dying. And I, I, thank you, thank you so much for that point. It's really what is a, what is the the preferred language of your organization? Assisted death. We use uh, assisted dying. Certainly the language of the court was physician-assisted dying, medical assistance in dying. I think the most important uh, word in there is dying. Um, and you know there will be different, uh, there, uh, hopefully with this legislation, there will be other health care providers. So not will... death, but dying, assisted dying. Is it assisted death, assisted okay. dying. Could I, I, just the uh, palliative care community is, is um, sometimes concerned about the use of an assisted death or physician-assisted dying or medically-assisted dying because sometimes that gets conflated with what is often in, uh, happens in palliative care where there is a medical person assisting you as you die. Uh, the term physician-hastened death or medically-hastened death is one that's being put out now by the palliative community, so I can throw that uh, alternate terminology out there. But if you wait another six months, we'll have another term. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Here. assisted death, uh, is the only person who has to be uh, asking for it, or is it, there a group or a panel? Does the doctor have to agree? Does the family have to agree? Or is it a one individual decision that can be made? So the, the, the request has to be initiated by the patient. Uh, in, at the moment, and I, I can broaden it to what will likely be the case under legislation, uh, that it would be brought forward by the, the request made by the patient. Um, the physician would have to assess this patient and make sure that, that this physician feels that the patient meets the criteria. Um, there would, in, in every jurisdiction, there's always a second opinion, somebody else who's independent has to come along and also agree. There are generally witnesses involved. There is um, a, a general advice to inform relatives and, and family members of the patient. Um, but not an absolute requirement, uh, except in uh, currently there's, there's a general sort of push in the Ontario interim guidelines to inform family members. And I think if you can imagine the scenario of a loved one that may be estranged from a family member and then get a phone call from an institution saying, you know, please come and collect your relative's things, you can, you can understand why that might be a very difficult phone call to receive and why legislators would want to build in things to prevent that from happening. But on the flip side, you have to rec understand that sometimes uh, you know, privacy does reign, and it is actually up to the patient to decide what they want to share with their loved ones and why. And we can advise, and, and I will always beg a family member, please let me call you know, your, your loved one. Uh, and, and this is not just an assisted death situation. This is uh, in any situation where somebody is dying. I will always want their family members to be aware so that they're not finding out after the fact. But it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. I'll also add that I think uh, the one thing that the Liberal government didn't do, uh, which I think the Conservatives would have done because pretty much the bill looks like it was written by the Conservative Party, um, is they didn't include a provision for uh, prior review, a, judici a judicial or uh, tribunal review. And this is something that opponents of assisted dying really want in the legislation. So we were very pleased to see that it's not, because it really is a private health care matter between the person, you know, their family if they choose, and their, and their health care providers. My question is about advanced care plans. I've been told that uh, the advanced care plans that we are preparing now are useless to a physician. Could, what can you tell us about what you need to make this work better? So a, a written advanced care planning document is not a legally binding document, um, which means that it is an, it's a set of instructions that your team is supposed to try to follow in the event that you are not able to make decisions for yourself in a time of illness. Um, it's an instruction to your substitute decision maker, so your loved one. Um, and, but 
you know, subject to whatever are the medical options. And, and your loved one and, and the medical team are supposed to work together to try to make a decision and, and effectively recreate the decision that you would have made had you been there. It's not what the doctor wants, not what your loved one wants, it's what you would have wanted. Um, we know that the documents from a lot of research are not that good at telling people what they, you know, reproducing what people would want in the moment. Um, they're very often uh, containing just very vague instructions that are not applicable or extremely specific instructions that are not applicable at the time of illness. What is very important about advanced care planning is to participate in it with your loved ones and prepare your loved ones for their role as your decision maker. So that's, it's not so much the document, but the process. And that's a three, at least a three-person conversation between you, your loved one, and your, uh, some medical practitioner who can give you some idea about what the kinds of decisions that person will have to make in the moment. And do your best to prepare for that and talk about what your values will be as you get sicker, what for you would be a life that you would want prolonged, what kinds of of therapies you would consider to be uh, heroic or excessive, what you would consider to be normal and acceptable that you would want. Those are the kinds of conversations you should have. I probably, can I add something to that too? I think that, you know, when we think of advanced care plans, it's important to remember that they vary from province to province. So different provinces have certain legal standings and others, and I think that uh, for our organization, we see that, you know, this is all about uh, patient choice. Um, you know, personal autonomy and the ability to, to request, uh, you know, what or have a substitute decision maker make decisions for you in, in advance if you're no longer able to do it for yourself. Uh, and that's a piece of work that we know uh, needs to be improved, that we know provincially that advanced care plans do not resuscitate orders, uh, that there needs to be greater legal standing moving forward. Because one of the, the really wonderful things about the court's decision besides, you know, the conversation here is that this conversation here is happening in people's homes. And people People are having those end-of-life uh, conversations and having difficult conversations with, with family members, but we do see a need moving forward to having uh, greater legal standing, uh, possibly through legislation, to ensure that your wishes in your advanced care plans uh, will be respected moving forward. I think we have time for one more question. Over here. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for the interesting dialogue. I was hoping uh, that you could touch on um, access issues. So once this legislation is rolled out, what are some access concerns in your opinion? You mentioned um, the right for hospitals to conscientiously object, but also that there'll be a spectrum of places where medical assistance in dying could take place. So in hospices, um, also in palliative care, and uh, what uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the government has only certain control over uh, healthcare institutions that are partially publicly funded. Uh, so I'll just jump in here. Um, that's a really important question, and when you think about a uh, human right or a right, it's only really a right if you can access it, right? If it's, if it's something that's in theory and you can't access it, it's a real problem. And there are a number of issues uh, that the federal government is going to parcel over, I believe, to the provinces uh, in our country. We have that unique tension of the federal government managing criminal affairs and the provinces largely being in control of, of health-related matters, including access. Uh, so our organization believes and supports patients, uh, uh, physicians' uh, right to conscientiously object uh, to providing an assisted death. Um, but we do believe that there has to be an effective transfer of care. We are talking about sick, ill, and dying people who are not going to be able to go to the phone book. Or I read recently something about an app. Um, <laughs> that, you know, they're not going to be able to access it. So there has to be a system um, where a physician that declines is able to effectively transfer their care to a physician who will be able to help that person. But also really critical, and I think it may be one of the big access pieces moving forward, is where will people die? So when we're talking about institutions that receive taxpayer funds, public funds, but also provide a public service, should they be able to opt out? And we know that there's been resistance from faith-based hospitals, Catholic uh, institutions, that they want to be able to opt out. And what I would say in that regard is that what the Catholic Church is asking for is what we're asking for. They want accommodation. They want to be able to say, we don't want to participate. Well, we want accommodation too. We want accommodation for the patients who are in those facilities and for the healthcare providers, who some of whom, I think many of whom, will feel a conscientious duty to provide an assisted death to help relieve the suffering of their patients. 
and they want protection. So they want protection for physicians uh, to be able to opt out, and they want protection for their whole institution. And we would say that a whole institution, you can't have four, five, 12 people on a board making a decision for what could be thousands of people who work and are residents in those facilities. And so we believe that there needs to be protection also um, for doctors and for people who want to receive an assisted death. When we think of where people die, I think most of us would say, I know I would, I want to be home in my bed you know, with my family. That's not really the reality. So people are going to die in hospices. They're going to die in places where that's their home. right? So if they're not allowed to die there and they have to go to some other facility, I feel that's harsh. These are the people that have been taking care of you. Even if you've only been in a palliative care unit for a couple of weeks, You've got a relationship with the doctors, the nurses, the staff there. The idea that you have to be ripped away from that support you know, circle and go someplace else at the most vulnerable time in your life, it feels cruel. And the last thing before I turn it over to James is that when we're talking about faith-based institutions, you know, in uh, Toronto, we're fortunate we have a number of hospitals uh, that you know you can probably go from one to another. But there are hospitals in this country where, and I'll take. Um, Comox Valley in British Columbia, St. Joseph's. It's a standalone facility for a number of different communities. If you have to go to another facility, you may have to travel 50 kilometers. So not only are you being ripped away from your circle of medical support, you're being ripped away from your community. And this is something that the provinces are going to have to address because the rubber will hit the road if people can't access this uh, assisted dying uh, in, in the places that they live. Give you a brief last word. Sorry, the, that's okay. The uh, the question of access is a very important one, but uh, also important to underscore the need for access more broadly to end of life care services. And we know that palliative care is uh, high quality palliative care is available to a lot of Canadians, but only if they happen to have uh, certain types of illnesses or be physically located in certain parts of the country. So if you have cancer, if you live in an urban area, you're very likely to get uh, good palliative care. If you have something else or live anywhere else, you are not. And that is a real challenge as we are moving forward to try to implement not just assisted dying, but a more comprehensive set of, of, of uh, services that can be offered to individuals. I spend a lot of my day connecting people with services because there really isn't a very easy system for people to plug into and figure out what services are available. And these are people who want palliative care and can't get it. The federal government is in a very strong position, and my, my other big criticism of Bill C-14 is in the preamble it makes reference to you know, non-legislative measures to uh, improve palliative care. But I don't understand why we can't add in you know, legislative measures. You can, by fiat, create a palliative care secretariat, a organization based at the federal government level whose job it is to monitor and set standards for palliative care that everybody across the country is going to have to meet, that will, will figure out what the research agenda should be and make sure it gets funded. The idea that, you know, considering how long it's taken us just to sort out one very narrow element of an assisted death, but we have a you know, fairly nebulous promise that one day we will have non-legislative measures. I, I think that the government has an opportunity here to put some teeth to this promise and make it happen and put it in this bill. Once again, I'd like to thank you both. Shanaz, James, thank you very much. Here comes Gordon. Thank you so much. Wonderful panel, great moderator, and, and some great questions. And, and by the way, to the gentleman that, that called me out on the mis, misuse of that expression, I do really do appreciate that. We're still learning our vocabulary in this area. And I, as, our, as our panel has said today, language is important. So, so thank you very much, sir, for pointing that out. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment I'm going to ask past President Gareth Seltzer to thank our esteemed panel guests today. Um, and I just want to say that, said a couple of words about Gareth. He's uh, really the type of guy I want to be when I grow up. Uh, many, many of you will know Gareth Seltzer as the restorer of many of Canada's premier historic residences, an initiative which has become known as the Seltzer Partnership. He's also the co-founder of Riot News and, of course, a renowned filmmaker, uh, producer and explorist. He was recently nominated for an Oscar. You may have seen him down at the Academy Awards for his poignant documentary entitled Body Team 12. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a great film. I highly recommend it. His films have also appeared in over 40 international film festivals. Gareth and his wife Monique also have the largest vintage Airstream collection in Canada, known as the Airstream Collective. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome here to express our collective appreciation, past president Gareth Seltzer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. You, you might be the subject of our next documentary. 
but because um, you have a pretty wide life yourself, to be honest. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's great to be here, and I just uh, briefly want to say that uh, having been a past president, I remember I think in my year in. 1997, I think I had Keith Norton, who was the chairman of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, a great hero, talking about dignity in life. And we've had many heroes, and uh, I think Dying with Dignity is one of those. We had the leadership of Wanda Morris for years as well, who is one of the reasons that we are on this stage. We just spend an extraordinary amount of time working on dignity in life. And one of the things that we haven't done is dignity and death. And uh, I think what I heard today uh, from all of you is, is James and, and Pia and Shanoz, I think we could all tonight hop in my wife's Subaru and drive to Montreal. And we would only see 250 feet at a time because that's all our headlights take us, 250 feet. We get there, we'd see the next 250 feet. And eventually we will get there. And I think what the Supreme Court of Canada has said is it's Let's get there now. And what you're saying is, let's do this right and get there now. Eventually, there will be advanced consent. It, it is essentially dictated in the Supreme Court of Canada's Carter case. Let's not drag our heels. Let's write this correctly right now. That's, that's what I heard from you. And, and I hope that all of you will share my appreciation for each of you coming here. And Pia, thank you so much for narrating this and bringing this discussion so articulately to our, to our table. Thank you, Gordon and the Empire Club of Canada. And on behalf of my wife and I, who are also underwriting this, I just want to say, man, we need, we need more people like you, and we need more people like you coming out for this kind of, of uh, collective, narrative, intellectual, social justice issue. It's, it's all about dignity, and I thank you. Gordon, thank you. Thank you so much, Gareth. And thank you uh, again, panel. Uh, uh, Pia, Pia, good luck with your new show. Yep. We're all going to be listening. Okay. And obviously, Shanaz and James, we're, we're going to be rooting for you behind the scenes. So best of luck to you. Thank you, uh, Gareth, especially for underwriting today's event. Uh, to, your, uh, to you and your wife, uh, Monique, uh, you made this event possible today. We'd also like to thank the National Post as our national print uh, media sponsor and, of course, Rogers Television our national broadcaster. We'd also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online media space, for live webcasting today's event, which is, believe it or not, how most people see the Empire Club now around the world. Follow us on Twitter at Empire underscore Club. You can also follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And please join us again in the coming weeks. We have some great events lined up. Uh, in fact, this Friday, we have uh, the minister responsible for innovation, science, and economic development what we used to call the Minister of Industry in the old days, Navdeep Baines, who will be uh, uh, with us at the Arcadian Court. On uh, May 4th, we have William Charnetsky, who is the Chief Health Innovation Strategist. So good link to what we're talking about today. Uh, he's going to be addressing us at One King West. And on June the 3rd, we have booked the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, who will be talking about uh, 150 years of Canada and the role that the Supreme Court has played in the laws of our land. Another good connection to our topic today. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.